Hey there, everybody. This is Peter Hafner, Certified Financial Fiduciary and Certified Financial Planner. And uh, thank you for joining us again today. We've got Don Miska with us again. Uh, Don's an elder law attorney with uh, with the firm F Fallsgraf, Beinhauer, Greer, Harris, and Schuler. And I'm sure some someday it's going to have Miska in there somewhere. So, uh, Don, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Doing good, Pete. Nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. And why don't we do this, Don? Let's just start off where we finished last time. Okay. And uh, where what we talked about last time was all kinds of different trusts and how they work and those kinds of things. So if you missed that, you can go back and uh, you can find that in our YouTube channel. And what we just started to get into was something called Persterpes, which maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. And then there's also something per capita, it's called, that goes right alongside it. So, Don, why don't you uh, tell us about per terpies and per capita, how they come into play, why they're important, and how they might affect the people who are paying, who are watching today? Yeah, and that's this is a good place to start because when when I meet with clients and I'm reviewing their prior wills or even setting up new wills for them. Um, I, when I review the documents, I, I will point out those two words, per stirpes. And I point at to them in their will and say, do you know what that means? And they're like, no, I have no idea what that means. And I said, well, per stirpes means if you're leaving your estate to your children per stirpes, it means that if any of your children um, predecease you, that predeceased child's share will go directly to that predeceased child's children. So to the grandchildren of the predeceased child. And some clients look at me, they give a blank stare and they're like, well, that's not what we want. <laughs> we didn't want it like that. And I would say, well, this is how it is right now. And if you want that change, then, you know, let's talk about making those changes. So yeah, so per stirpes means, it, literally, it's, it's Latin, it means by the branch. So if you think about it, parents have three children and say you have child A, B, and C. Child A has two children and think of it as like a branch. Um, child A and they got two children and it branches out. Child B has three children and it branches out as well. And child C has four children. So you got all of these branches. So that's what per stirpes means. So if you have a predeceased child, their share will branch out, so to speak, or go to that predeceased child's share. If if the if the predeceased child has uh, has a child who has a disability um, or, or who's a minor who's under the age of 18, that is challenging as well. Then you need to make sure you set up trust provisions under your last will and testament. And especially if your grandchild has a disability, you do not want them to inherit anything from their predeceased child. You can set it up and structure it as a supplemental needs trust um, under your will. But that's why it's really important. And, and when I meet with clients, and I thought about this the other day, because I had a doctor's appointment. And I went to a new doctor uh, for the first time. And you know, they, they, you go through the questions, right? Your, your medical history and, and all of this, right? And when you go to a doctor, you, you, you kind of expect those types of questions, the background information, right, to give to a new doctor. But clients, when I meet with clients and I'm asking them, you know, their background information, more information about their family, they're kind of like looking at me like, well, why do you need this? We're not here for them. We're here, you know, for us. This is what we want. But if you kind of think of it as if you're going like a, if you're meeting a lawyer, elder law attorney, and we're asking you these questions, there's a reason we're, we're, we're not just doing this to take up time. There's a reason to make sure that whatever we're doing for you, what we're putting uh, in place for you doesn't 
adversely affect your other surviving, you know, children or grandchildren. So, but the per stirpes thing is, is really, really important. Um, if you don't have per stirpes, if it's not indicated as per stirpes in your will, maybe it's listed as per capita. Per capita is completely different than per stirpes. Per stirpes, remember, we have the branch. You have child A with two kids and it branches off if that child predeceased, right? Under a per capita distribution, it really means by head that are specifically named. So, so mom and dad have three children. Child A has two kids. Child B has three children. And child B dies before mom and dad. Child C has four children. And child C also died before mom and dad. So you just have child A with two kids. And if everything went per capita, who do you think? Do you think the grandchildren of the deceased child B and deceased child D, uh, uh, child C, get anything? No. Per capita means that if any of your children predeceased you, their children receive zero. And it only goes to the surviving child, your surviving beneficiary. If you wish your grandchildren to receive something, if it's a, like a per capita distribution, you have to specifically name your grandchildren. Because again, it goes by head. Um, the descendants of, of a predeceased beneficiary under a per capita uh, distribution gets zero. Only the named beneficiary gets that inheritance. So if you, in that scenario, you have three children and you're thinking, oh, a third, a third, a third to each of my kids, they predeceased and their kids are going to get it. Maybe not. If it's per capita, it may all go to one surviving child um, when you pass away. So really big, really big dis uh, distinctions between both of yeah. those works. Yeah. yeah. Now you mentioned wills. This comes into play in wills and that's really important. But we need everyone to remember this can come into play with your IRA, 401k, with your annuity, everything that has a beneficiary designation. Right, uh, right, Don? Yeah, that that is correct. And that's why you know, you you really should review the beneficiary designations if there's changes in your, you know, the family situation. Um, you know, again, maybe for certain circumstances, you don't want a particular child or grandchild uh, to automatically receive any money when you pass away or immediately receive any money. Um, you know, you you really have to make sure you put your plan in place well ahead of time. Yes. And you just said it. Review. Reviewing beneficiary designations on all your different accounts is really, really important. And in fact, this, if you are actually reviewing and updating whenever there is a change, the per stirpes would never even come into play, right? Because when someone passes away, you update the beneficiary designations. The way this comes into play where per stirpes comes, becomes consequential is when people are not reviewing and updating beneficiaries, maybe at all, or at least not in a timely fashion. And yeah, I've seen that in my practice. I'm sure you've seen it too and heard horror stories, right? Yeah. Every time when I meet with clients, I, I always say, uh, you know, I ask them about their retirement accounts, their life insurance, and do you have beneficiaries? And when they tell me, oh, well, yeah, I think we have, a, you know, I think my wife or my spouse is the beneficiary. I think we have the children. I said, well, you want to make sure yeah. <laughs> you don't want to think you want to be certain that you have that already written out and designated before anything happens to you. Yeah, so for all those people out there who are watching or maybe taking notes, really, really important. Make a note to make sure you review with all the different investment advisors you work with, 
And if you're doing things on your own, review and make sure beneficiary designations are set up properly the way you want them and that they've got per stirpes and per capita. And then one other, one other thing I just thought of that happens a lot is there are life changes. You know, a spouse dies, there's a divorce. And in the chaos of the moments, people will forget to change beneficiaries and they don't always remember. So it's not uncommon that a divorced spouse is still a beneficiary. Uh, or a deceased spouse, maybe. So it's really, really important to check these things out. Yeah, now, yes, it is. Yeah, everybody's got to keep doing their homework. <laughs> that's right. Now, uh, so we talked about per stirpes by the branch and per capita by the head and how they're different. Um, are you aware, Dawn, that in my experience, it seems like per capita seems to be the default if nothing is selected? Is that true in your experience too? Yeah. Do you know if that statute in New York State? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and okay. again, it, yeah. So, so yeah. So and again, if you if that's the default and that's not what your wishes are, you want to make sure you have that uh, you have that updated. Yeah. So these things. It's the little things that can really cause you a lot of trouble. By, if we take care of the little things, the big things usually take care of themselves, is my experience. Mm -hmm. So for all of you watching, it's really important to stay on top of these things. And we've said this before in prior videos. I just want to remind everyone, you want to have a will, but you got to remember that beneficiary designations on your 401k IRA 403b or anything else, they supersede your will. So just because the will says per stirpes, if that's the way you want it to go to your three kids and then it goes by the branch to your grandchildren, well, if all your money's in your 401k and you forgot to check and it's per capita, then you're disinheriting potentially your grandchildren. So yep. really, really important that we check all the designations and make sure they're the way we want. And when I, I mean, when, when we meet with clients, we can provide them because when you think about it, you know, per, uh, per stirpes per capita, it, it's a foreign term to everybody. And, and sometimes it is kind of hard, you know, to see what that would look like. Yes. So we can provide the clients kind of like, you know, with an outline or, or uh, a diagram, like, okay, here's what it would be. Here's what it would look like. And is this what your intention is so that they understand that? Yeah. Now, one other thing, I think we've talked about this before, but it's worth repeating anyway. Um, sometimes the grandchildren who are going to inherit the money if parents have died before the grandparents who are leaving it, the grandchildren are minors. So what happens in that situation, Don? Uh, under a last will and testament, you mean? Yeah, we'll talk about a last will and testament. And let's say it's per stirpes, grandma dies, and the money's going, they, she thought to her daughter or son, now it's going to minor grandchildren. And yeah. maybe, maybe it's the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law is in charge of the kids. He's the, he's the custodian of the kids. How does this all play out? Well, how it would all play out is if you have a predeceased child, and and if you're under your will, if there's anything that's going through probate, um, you have a predeceased child, you pass away, and now um, it's going to that predeceased child's children. Okay. Yes. And if those children are under the age of 18, their share, if if their distribution is less than ten thousand dollars by law, they can receive that distribution directly under the under the estate under the will. If it's more the than minor that, children can receive that, and they can put it in the bank for them. Yep, okay, good. Yep. But if it's more than ten thousand dollars to the minor children, then it has to go into a trust. Okay. So, and you can set up a trust under your last will and testament for the benefit of any minor beneficiaries, okay? And you can designate who the trustee is, who the person is in charge of that money, okay, okay. for the minor beneficiary. 
Okay. Okay. If you don't have the trust set up for minor beneficiaries and you don't have a last will and testament in place and your child predeceased you and now their share goes to their children, okay, your son or daughter in law is then the person in charge over that minor beneficiary's money. And if you don't get along with your son or daughter-in-law, um, or even if your, your child is divorced from their spouse, it's going to go to the biological parent as the legal guardian of the minor child. And if that's not what your wishes are, you better have something set up under your will in a trust for any minor beneficiaries. Wow. So if someone doesn't think about these things and the attorney doesn't bring it up and their will is set up per capita, and if their child has died and the minor children inherit more than $10,000, now it's the son-in-law or the daughter-in-law who affect it. They don't inherit the money, but they are in charge of the money. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the son or daughter-in-law, they, they don't inherit the money. They are in charge. They're, they're the custodian of that money for their children until the children turn 18. Yes. Okay. Now, yep. but if, you, if this is just thought through when you're putting together your will, it's very simple is what you're saying to set it up per stirpes. And then part of a will is that trust. And the trust is built in the will to name maybe even two people to take care of the, the grandchildren. Well, no, not in grandma and grandpa as well, but there would be a trustee that would determine how the money you would, when you're setting up your will, decide different parameters mm -hmm. on how the grandchildren can get the money, even beyond age 18 in that case, right? You can do it to 35, maybe 45. They finally get everything, especially if it's a lot oh. of money. Oh, yes, certainly, certainly. Um, it, it, it just under New York state law, when somebody turns 18, they're considered an adult. Okay. So it, you can have your trust under your will say, well, when, you know, when they turn 18, they get the money or when they turn 21, we usually like to put in the, the 21 clause. Because mm -hmm. um, when you're 18, you know, you get ten thousand dollars. Who who knows what you're going to do with it nowadays? So we usually put in like a a, a, a twenty one um, clause uh, for any minor beneficiaries. But you can set it up however you want. You can say, well, I want that minor beneficiary share in trust until yeah, until they're thirty five years old. But at age thirty, they get maybe a percentage of the money in the trust and a, at age 25 a percentage and then when they turn 35 then they get everything so yeah you you can set it up however however you want you control all of that let's say you didn't think of all this and now it's happened and you really don't like that uh that spouse of your deceased child is there anything you can do can you go to court and try and get a guardian appointed or the gates are open and the horses are gone and now it's too late. It, it, yeah. Well, ironically, what would have to happen is even though the daughter or son-in-law is the biological parent of the minor beneficiaries, they still would have to go to court to be appointed the legal guardian to be in charge over the minor beneficiaries' money. Oh, no kidding. Okay. But yeah, but if they do, if they have to do that, now you're you're like sharing a a a co guardianship with the court. So in other words, the court will be keeping an eye on what you're doing as the guardian. Oh. But there's more court costs. There's more time, attorneys' fees involved with all of that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you don't want the court involved if you can avoid it. It just, it's expensive, it's time consuming and slows everything down. Yes, and especially now, unfortunately with COVID, um, no. the, yeah. the courts are, yeah, the courts are backed up about 120 days in processing. Wow. 
Wow. And they were never Any applications? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, the kids might not be minors anymore, but I, I exactly, to exactly. All right. Here, let me let me go back to uh, this per capita situation. Let's say someone wanted uh, the money to go per stirpes, but they didn't know what per stirpes was, and it didn't get done. Um, I know a lot of times people I talk to they think their kids can just sort of sort it out. You know, the kids will do the right thing, and Let's talk about this kind of a scenario, okay? Let's say there's two adult children. One was predeceased. To keep it simple, let's say each of the adult children each had two children. So the surviving uh, adult child, if it were set up per capita, they're going to inherit 100% of the parents' assets. And maybe that surviving, maybe that uh, child knows, feels that his parents wanted half of it to go to the grandchildren of his sibling. In reality, how, how complicated or how easy is it for that, sur for that surviving sibling to sort of make things right and split the inheritance so that his niece and nephew actually get it? Is that, how possible is that? How does that, how would that play out? By law, the surviving child has no legal obligation to split that money with the grandchildren of the predeceased child, unless it's written in the will. Okay, if if you don't have a will, and 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 yeah, and and if it is, you know, per capita, it's not written in the will then. It's In not fact, right. it's set up explicitly to go the way that it that it went. Yeah, exactly. And and as I said, the the surviving child under the per capita um, per capita language, the surviving child has no legal obligation to split that money with the with with his predeceased child uh, predeceased siblings' children. Absolutely no legal obligation to do that. All right. Let's let's play this mind game though. Let's say it was a reasonably large Western New York sort of inheritance. Let's say it's like $800,000. And let's say this, uh, uh, this sibling who was living wanted to make it, make it right the way he thinks his parents wanted it. And he wanted to take half of that and split it between his niece and nephew. How, what does that look like? Can they really do that? Or is he causing, if he's a wealthy person, you tell me, what does that look like? And is it possible? Or what kind of problems is it, does this lead to? So if, if that surviving sibling wants to be a good person mm -hmm. and he wanted to, you know, give the, the nieces and nephews, uh, you know, some money, I would recommend setting up a trust, telling the surviving child well, if you're if you want to give this money to the nieces and nephews of your predeceased sibling, let's set it up under a trust. Okay. So then that way, you know, you can be in charge of that money. You can designate alternate trustees. You can designate what that money is going to be used for, how you know how long it's going to be paid out. Let's keep it aside. Let's keep it safe so that the, 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 there's no chance of, of anybody um, like running away with it as, you know, who, whoever would be in charge over that money. Okay. So that's really not that complicated. They yeah. can do this. They contact you. They contact an attorney and set up a trust or maybe two trust, one trust or two trust. Oh, they could, they could set up um, one trust and each of the uh, nieces and nephews as beneficiaries or set up separate trusts. It depends what, what, what their ultimate goal is, what they're looking to do. Gotcha. Okay. Now, there's something I haven't thought about very much since the 90s. And that's the, what do they call it? The, the gift tax, the gift tax exemption used to be $12,000 many years ago. I think it's $14,000 now. Um, so does this run afoul of that at all? Because he's essentially gifting $400,000 to the between the niece and the nephew, where no. they're only allowed to gift fourteen thousand dollars per year per person. 
if if the surviving child has a spouse um they could gift up to uh, thirty thousand dollars um to like to each blood person um so with this individual setting up the trust uh, again it can be structured to avoid any of those uh, taxes under the annual gift tax exclusion so let me let me back up a little bit so i thought i think i thought it was fourteen thousand dollars you're saying it's fifteen thousand dollars a year okay that's where it is this year and yes a husband and wife can both do it so now it's thirty thousand dollars for the niece and another thirty thousand dollars for the nephew so does that mean in year one, 60,000 total is the most they could put into this trust without reducing their estate tax exemption? Yeah, if, if, if it's just the two children that are two um, nieces and nephews, yeah, certainly. It, it would be 30,000 um, per each person, yeah. Okay, now here, here's the other thing I'm thinking about though. The gift tax exemption used to be very important because many, many of the people I was working with back in the 90s would potentially owe estate taxes because the exemption before having to pay estate taxes was relatively low. It was 650000 then it was 675 And if your house is worth back then two hundred and fifty dollars or $300,000 and you got some money, many, many people were over that estate tax exemption. But today, on the federal side, it's twenty-two million dollars right now. Anyway, might go down to eleven million in uh, twenty-six, but that's where it is right now. So, if people, if there's no way they're ever going to meet, so let's say this imaginary person, there's no way is he's ever going to have estate taxes because his net worth is maybe, let's say, it's one and a half million dollars magnitudes under the federal estate tax exemption. Does the gift tax exemption even matter? No. Okay, so he could no. really put, just do it, put $400,000 in there. Yes, it's going to count against the federal gift tax exemption, but if he's never going to pay estate taxes, it has no impact at all. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. But, but New York State is not the same as the Fed. The federal, gift ta uh, the federal estate tax exemption is $22 million right around there right now. And on the state in New York State, it's much, much lower. It's only a little over $6 million for a couple, correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay. And if, if this person, if his net worth was not $1.5 million, but $5.5 million, and let's say he's 50 years old, now he's in great danger of having a state tax, of paying a state taxes to New York State. Mm -hmm. And now the gift tax exemption, he better pay attention to that. The, yes, we would counsel clients to say, all right, well, let's start doing gifting. Let's start reducing your New York State um, estate tax liability. Um, yeah, let, let's start gifting your money out. Let, let's start doing that. So, yeah, especially, yeah, they are, you know, five and a half, um, you know, million, close to the six million range. Yeah, that, that's what we advise clients to do. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm not clear on this, too. I know for a couple in New York State, the estate tax exemption is just a little over six million dollars. But do you know what it might be for an individual filer? If you don't, it, that's it, okay. We can get back it, to them on it. It would still, I believe it would still be the 6.1, it's just a little $6.1 million. Yeah. That's kind of what I thought. So it doesn't yeah. matter, single filer or yeah. whatever. Okay, $6 right. million. Yeah. So what everyone out there really needs to be aware of is if your total net worth is approaching $6 million and you live in New York State, you need to be doing some estate planning. And one of the biggest things you can do, Don just said, is follow the, uh, the gift tax exemption amount, but start gifting to your kids. Um, what are some of the other strategies people can use so that they can avoid, which is perfectly legal and appropriate, avoid paying estate taxes if possible? Yeah, well, setting up trusts. Um, you know, for the kids, for the grandkids, um, 
that that again that that is another option and but then this goes back to when i started we going to the doctor's office and getting the background we need to know when 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 we're asking questions like how much do you have it's not that we're being nosy okay we need to know that information so that we can help you so that yeah if you are potentially going or you're close to that uh, estate tax threshold so that we can then maybe choose a different path of planning for you to reduce that um, to reduce any taxes upon your death okay what i'd like to do is the next time we get together i want to talk a lot more about uh, a couple or an individual someone who's either real close or maybe over the uh, new york state estate tax exemption and then we can have a conversation about the common things people do to, because I, I think there's some, you'll tell us next time, but I think there's some pretty simple things people can do to uh, effectively put themselves in a position where they can have double or close to double that net worth and still avoid estate taxes. So yeah. Don't put it all away, but that's true, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. All right, Don, this is always fun. It's always interesting. Um, and we're right at the end of summer now, too. Is there anything uh, coming up for you that you're looking forward to in the next few weeks? Ah, uh, no. And 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 my uh, my secretary just uh, you know we were talking about this today, and it doesn't feel like it's the end of summer. It feels like it's the beginning of summer. It's like where did it go? <laughs> well, the time way I feel the same way, but it's it feels like the end of summer. It feels feels like fall's coming in. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a little disappointing. But, when it gets uh, dark, when it's dark at six o'clock in the morning, it, and, and you know the sun isn't up by six o'clock when I get up, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have the first tee time at the golf course I like to play at every Saturday, and it's been six thirty. And I think it's next week it's uh, six fifty instead because of the the daylight fluctuation. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Don, thanks for joining us today. And for all you people out there, just want to say thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate your time and your attention. If you've got questions for us, please email them to Sam at service at HafnerFinancial.com. Make sure you click the like button if you like the video and please subscribe and then you'll see every time we put out new videos. So thank you all. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time. All right. Nice seeing you, Peter.